inventory. You guys get to do that on your own, which is the only place it can be done. If in relationship, I highly recommend you do not take this and start doing your partner's inventory. Um, for one thing, it will break this tool as far as maybe being used within a relationship and how to navigate a relationship. Um, I like to, I do realize I can look over at Annette and I can maybe think, wow, she's in this area and I might navigate her a little bit differently, but I'm not going to go tell her what, where she's at. That's each of our jobs. So I really see this as a huge emotional growth piece. Um, and so fit the addiction, grief, loss, I think they all fit together um, into tonight's talk and jump in wherever you want. There's a bathroom there, and if you're too shy, you could walk all the way over to another one, but then you might end up in an intensive outpatient program, and you might not want to be there tonight. Um, there's some trees, too, or you can go see the Buddhist next door. That's all up to you. <laughs> Which um, door is the bathroom? Right there. Right here, and there's a fan, so it's loud. And there's, and there's, and there's uh, hot water and that sort of thing back here. Coffee. Tea. And we'll take a little break in the middle. Do we have any smokers? That's not a shame question. Okay, because I can get killed if I don't give a break and there's a smoker in the room. <laughs> so it can become very dangerous very quickly. So, um, okay. Um, and so feel free to get up. The stuff I'm talking about is intense and you need to walk around. Cool. Um, you might just let Kyle know that you're cool and we don't have to chase after you. And so just a thumbs up, um, just so you know that. Um, so we're going to jump in and go. The first part is more of the clinical side. I'm a great believer of our brain, for most of us, needs an intellectual finger hold. And then it can feel safe enough to move down into the psyche and into the emotional world. Some people might need that emotional piece to start moving up to the cognitive piece, but most of us because our brain is always scouring a room, we need some sort of finger hold. Um, I definitely know I do. So I will probably say something that triggers somebody. So please remember I'm coming from purity of intent, which we'll talk about tonight. Um, and please remember that the piece of our brain that does vocabulary is about that big. And the piece that receives is about that big. And so, yet yeah, we're talking about something so expensive, there is no words for that sort of thing. If this was a grief talk, well, this starting tomorrow, we have loss of a child workshop out at Golden Little Retreat, and my mother would be very angry with that title because her, her son is not lost. He is dead, and he died in Alaska. And so for her, that word loss is a huge trigger. And a little backstory because it's also my brother, as well as Barb's, is Richard's body was the only body found on that fishing boat. And so there are many other parents who have children who are still lost. So just those difference of words are going to come up. In the recovery world, many people get caught on the word God. And then they have to work with how to either move that word into D-O-G and be dog, or higher power, or asshole, or whatever it needs to be. Um, so please, with whatever semantics I'm using, just flip the word if you can. Um, and a great thing about this talk is, if you can, be conscious of what your system's doing. Not only somatically, but definitely physically and somatically. But where does your brain want you to pop out of something? In the therapy world, I'll tell you a little secret. If you're sitting there working on something and all of a sudden the client goes, ah, interesting. Well, they've just given themselves some cognitive dissonance and it's become a very interesting file to themselves because maybe something was too deep to go into. So, so just watch, not good or bad, but just where is your system going? How is this going? Um, I'm not doing anybody's inventory or leading anybody to any place. It's just information. So with that in mind, 
for me, this is actually truly one of the reasons I'm still alive today. And it's one of the reasons for 20 years now I haven't put this out publicly, because it's that intimate to me. Over the years, it's become the rudder and the keel of my boat. But the really cool thing is it's become a B Corp. In other words, it's also self-sustainable and it builds my own fuel. <laughs> and it allows me to have a, something that moves forward and gives me passion to get up in the morning and be excited even on difficult mornings to get up. So it allows me that peace. Um, most people have been to grief group. That's, that If you haven't, that's cool. We talk a lot about the boat and the boat of life and how it just gets filled up. So when I'm talking about the boat, I'm talking about that boat. And otherwise, read my book and you'll get to learn about the boat. Um, but uh, in the grief work, we can rebuild our container but that's usually not enough. This picture that's back by Barb and Ashley, um, the first time I saw that, I almost just shattered because I felt it was the best explanation of craving, of just reaching but not quite being able to grab whatever I'm trying to grasp, and I don't even know what I'm trying to grasp. And so I actually stole that from a friend who... Uh, he did it so that he could build a bronze sculpture. Um, <laughs> but I said, well, I really like the picture, so he framed it for me. Um, because it meant so much to me. That, for me, is grief. That's addiction. Actually, it's more loss in the grief process and addiction in the recovery process. How do I reach for something that's not tangible, that my brain can't put in data and then give to Genevieve to run the data analysis on? <laughs> with Max QBA. Um, so, so for me, that's how big this is. Um, it's in a day, I can go from a rape to a divorce to a death to violence to child abuse to someone who wants to learn about spirituality all in a day and still be excited about being here tonight. And that's not because I'm all muscles, otherwise I'd crash right away. But through this process, also, I've learned I can really hold other people's stuff here with strong arms connected to a deep heart. And so I can have it be out here, and in that I don't hijack someone else's story as well. And I can go home, and not everyone comes home with me in a backpack. Um, so just one last rule that, that I already said in a different way. Thou shall not therapize thy family member. <laughs> It doesn't work. And I actually say it every time I go home. Remember that, Andy. <laughs> so it's how I take my hard hat off and put it in the car truck um, and then go into my house. And the other one I use all day long is thou shalt not play God on someone else's path. So those two help me. Um, so you might remember that within your own families. Because um, I promise if you go home and I Annette, you're just caught in your scared child. Well, she's going to move to her bully pretty quick and kick my ass. So, so, so please just know that piece. Um, so we're going to jump in. In the grief process, we talk a lot about denial, anger, bargaining, depression, acceptance, and then I added the unknown and the relocation. And we move in and out of these, and we move back and forth because we're fluid. And, so we're, and we're porous, actually. And... And so we move back and forth and all around, and that's just how the stew works, the stew of grief. Please remember that there's loss, and then there's grief, and they're not the same thing. We have a loss, and then as we redefine ourselves, we're in a grief process. That can also help your psyche be open to that. So in that, that's not where we're going tonight, but I just wanted that reminder. Addiction, we have what they call the contemplative stages which is very similar, and you have different levels of where you are in that process of needing to, maybe at first I'm unaware that I might have an addictive issue, and then I might become aware, but I don't want to do anything about it, and I start to take action and move into those. And they fit along with these. And what's really cool is 
from the four agreements, my Miguel Ruiz, to the 12 steps, to the eight laws of Buddha, to the grief process, all of these, they're all a similar path with different vocabulary. And that's what I find so cool. It's how Betty Ford decided to hire me was because I was looking and seeing, there's this thing called grief, and then there's this thing called addiction, and they run the same path, but no one has bridged the two. And so, and that, why I get excited is then it's no longer a cognitive process for me, it's a spiritual process because it's natural and normal. I don't sit and analyze when I have a cut here. Okay, now are all the molecular pieces lining up and is the scab going right? And, and I need to analyze it. And, no, it's a natural, normal healing process. And, so I get excited about that. And so, any questions before we jump in? Then let's jump in. I know I fall asleep at 9.05, so we will be out of here at 8.30 because I do have to drive home. <laughs> so, I don't go on a retreat quite often. I go way past that when it's a long drive home, the whole six miles. So um, we're going to play around with this, and I do get goofy, but also at the same time, I do promise you this is the most, if we have boundaries, and so for me, I'm in Seco, we have Taos, and then we have the blinking light, and then we have Seco itself, and then I have my house, and then I have the living room, and then I have the hallway, and then I have the bedroom, and then I have my underwear drawer. And in those, there are different boundaries that I <coughs> allow, because that's my work of boundaries, of more this way than this way. Who do I allow into those places? Until this year, except for at Golden Oil Retreat, this has really been in my underwear drawer. It's that precious to me and that important. So I'm pulling out my gems. So <laughs> I did say my jewels. <laughs> That's another door. Um, but get water or whatever what you need, and we'll go with this. So um, a lot of this, well, actually, Genevieve and I probably would probably be able to sit around and find enough research to back it up, but I think it would actually be a buzzkill and I'm not going to take the magic out of it. So I'm going to say this is just Tedisms. This is just me making up stuff. Of course, it would fit into Freud with no problem. Freud did some good work. Because remember, our seminal researchers do set a foundation so we can continue to research more. I think it's a bad deal. It could be very union. It can fit into internal family systems. So what's really cool and I love is that it, the clinical and spiritual just come together. And, and I like that. So, but tonight I'm just going to talk like this is all fact and really it's just stuff I'm making up. So just, just know that, please. Um, I believe we come into this world with our authentic self. And within that authentic self, we're all different. Just like our thumbprints, just like our earlobes and our earprints, the leaves, the snowflakes, all those different pieces. And most of us do have thumbs, and so we do have a certain container that contains us, that holds us with all of our individual pieces. So this would be the chalice that holds our individuality. Um, and so that outside structure or chalice of the thumb would be those pieces of the golden rule. Be good to yourself, be good to the earth, be good to others. Um, the five laws of you know, whichever you want to go into. And so these, that makes up the universal values, as they and I like to say. Um, so, but inside is very individualized. And so, we come into this world, and it's like, World peace, love, joy, connection, harmony. And then we start getting banged up. Boom, boom, boom. And as we talked about as we talk about the boat, and all of a sudden maybe, well, first I'm born and I have to breathe and poop and pee for myself, and that's no fun. It's kinda of nice just hanging out. And then maybe I wasn't fed right when I wanted, or maybe I didn't get out of the crib right when I wanted, or the example I like to give is when Leslie and I Carrie finally was sitting up at five months, and so we took her down to Baca Park, and we set her on the bench and stood back to take her picture, and she went and fell off. She didn't start crying until she saw our faces, 
And then she was horrified by our horrified faces. So we have these things that start happening to us. And our psyche goes, holy crap. I need to figure out a way to protect myself. So we have this true identity that we come into, and then through loss, we start to make these other parts of us. I'm not talking multi-personality disorder or schizophrenia or any of that, but just those different parts of us that work within us. So for the true identity, I'm actually going to share mine um, tonight. And so... My first one, that's the only one I have a first on, is purity of intent. And I need that one. And I'm not trying to convince, I'm not trying to sell you. I don't get to change your fingerprints. So if I get to talk about me tonight, how fun. <laughs> um, so purity of intent gives me the bravery to stand in front of all of you. There's this amazing group of people who are super smart and are all connected in their own different ways. But it gives me the bravery to stand up in front and say, hey, here's a flashlight that worked for me. Maybe it will work for you. And if it doesn't, that's okay. So it gives me that. Purity of intent also gives me the room where if I do bonk into someone, I can know I'm coming from that pure place and I can make my amends. She takes them or doesn't take them. That's Nancy's choice. But I know I have been doing my best. So purity of intent, I do have a number one on. The rest... I don't never remember which order I put them in. So I'm definitely a spiritual seeker. If you notice, I didn't say a religious seeker. I have no problem with religions. I think they're kind of cool. And I think they're great vehicles that can help us out. But I am so interested in why the heck we're all here tonight. And what is that connection that allows us to have that intimacy and find ways of connecting to have something bigger than whatever's contained in the skin. So it's huge for me, and it keeps me curious every single day. I'm of service to people. And no one's going to debate me on that one. <laughs> <laughs> and, and, and I'm going to jump in on this for a minute. And so as I'm doing these, please know that there's a lot of things I'd like to be. But they don't go chunk. They don't just go boom. Genevieve would agree, I could do a lot more yoga. <laughs> okay? And she has always busted me when I go like this so I can still touch the floor. <laughs> so I could do a lot more, but it doesn't go chunk. There are certain people in these town in this town that if they didn't do yoga, they would probably either kill themselves or OD or be back in the addiction world. So for them, that piece would go chunk. And so these are the true, authentic pieces of me. It doesn't mean there's not a lot of things I'd like to be. My wife, Marcella's service to animals. We went to the same ministerial school. So, believe it or not, it trips me out. Even the old birds are now coming to our house to die. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and as they're dying, she gives them Reiki, and then she sets them on a post, and the hawk comes and takes them. Mm -hmm. Say, like, don't go over to that side of the house because we have an old one on that corner now. <laughs> so, so, she, so she is of service to animals. Now, it doesn't mean I'm evil to animals and out there trying to eat the doves and do that sort of thing. I'm actually really good with animals, but it doesn't mean it's not just that passion piece of me. And I do, when she leaves town, I get the fly swatter out and get all the flies killed before she comes back. <laughs> um, because she catches the flies and sets them outside. That's nice. And I go, and now they'll reproduce, and now we have three instead of two. <laughs> so, but that's her service. That's her way of being of service. Um, I do put the spiders out now. <laughs> I'm, I'm trying. So there's places that we can continue to grow and we might want to grow. But it doesn't mean they're the chunk of us that just goes right to here. Um, I'm a big believer, and I try to come from here. Honesty and integrity. Someone else might not have those together. To me, they walk hand in hand and are together. They're really important to me. So these were the first four, and we're going we're gonna to tell stories later on. 
that will help explain some of that too on how I came up with these. And so while we're talking, please know, just like the book, The Purpose of Witnessing Ted was that maybe you could witness someone else's story, so actually you could sneak in the back door and look at your own story. So please remember, I'm not as important as each one of you in your own world. So please let that back door be open. Um, just this last year, I added one more. So I started playing with this in 1997. That's how serious these are to me. We flirt with them, we date them for a really, really long time, and then we might marry them. Okay? So as you, if you choose, and you start playing with these, just know, let them, let's see how they really fit before we actually have them completely in this category. All right? And so just this last year, I added humor. And if Clint was here tonight, he'd say, no shit. Right. <laughs> like, it really okay. took you that long. <laughs> 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 Kayla's poor office, they just don't know if I'm ever serious. Because <laughs> the minute I step out of that office, I have to be really serious. So, so when I come back in, it's all... <laughs> so they're just not quite sure what to do with me. Humor took a very long time for some very real reasons. Growing up in a town at my time that was 4% white... One of the jokes was the teacher would say things in Spanish, the whole class would get up and then look at me and laugh because I didn't know what he'd ask. Or he would ask to have a tack put on my chair while he called me up. Um, humor is also a great way I could bounce out of my true stuff rather than sit with myself. My master's work, my final thesis was on Robin Williams. It made sense to me why well, on many different levels, but one of the reasons that he would end up dying, killing himself, was because humor, he was always bouncing out, and most of the humor was by attacking himself before he was attacked. And it's like, you can't put up with that forever. Addiction, bipolar, there's a lot of other stuff, but a lot of it are those sort of things. So humor, on the other side, had such a huge sword and so many wounds for me. It took me that long to be able to claim that it's probably the one that has allowed me to still be alive today. So, so those are my five. What I love about spirituality is keep it simple. I mean, we, we take this brain and we start doing all this convoluted stuff and all of a sudden... So, purity of intent would mean this, but that would mean social control, which would mean this, and then I don't have autonomy, and all of a sudden I've forgotten even what purity of intent means. So, if you choose to play with these, you're going to look at a bunch of them, and then you're going to see what go chunk. The first time I went to Peru and did the trek, we were up in a certain area, and I, I got sick, and so I puked out my tent. And after we all went to bed, a puma came down and ate the puke and went back into the woods. That's really lucky. Well, it didn't eat me. Um, <laughs> but also, the porters, that's about one of the most important animals for them because the puma tracks itself and then devours anything that's not good for itself. And so here they watch it all played out at this crazy white horse <laughs> tent. And so, and also the puma's paws are soft. And so we're actually gentle with ourselves. And so I see this whole piece as tracking oneself to devour anything that actually doesn't serve me. So there's the true identity for me. And then you guys would play around with your pumas and start tracking yourself. Now this is how we're born. And so here I am all happy. And then these different pieces happen. So right away, early on in life, fear equals abandonment, which equals death. If I'm not given the breast or the bottle, I die. If I'm not given protection and warmth from the weather, I die. So fear is because I think there's an abandonment happening, and it means I'm dying. And that fits deep into grief. Because when I have a loss, I have been abandoned. 
no matter if someone meant to, didn't mean to, or something, somehow I have been abandoned of how I knew my life. And I'm very careful in saying that because Leslie every day works so hard to stay alive, to hear her little girl's feet come down that hallway. And yet I was abandoned, left with five and a three-year-old. So it doesn't mean that those other stories aren't true, and she is one of my heroes, but I was abandoned, and in that I die with the definition of me. If I am an addict of any type, I am so fearful that once again that breast or bottle is going to be taken away when I am in that craving state. That's the part of my brain I'm in. And so this is very real. And I think it's how we can sneak into looking at these different parts of us. So these other parts of us are survival skills that have become non-productive habits. In the recovery world, they're called character defects. And in the recovery world, and in that industry, I use those words because that's what they're used to, I think those words suck. Because right away my brain's going to go, well, then why would I want to look at those? <laughs> And if I look at them, I want them gone. I don't get to throw them off the bus. Mm -hmm. they, they're part of me. And so it comes down to how do I honor them and turn them into assets rather than liabilities? Good old transformational psychology. So if I realize that every piece of me was invented by me, in order to survive. And then now maybe that doesn't serve me, but it doesn't mean I'm going to throw them off the bus. Because otherwise my psyche's not going to want to pull them out. So the game whack-a-mole, that I always thought was whack-a-mole, <laughs> I found out it wasn't. Why would any piece of me, why would my psyche deliver a piece to me if I'm going to hit it on the head? Okay. So it's allowing these pieces of me to be here, and they will show up as I build enough infrastructure to have them be presented. So when I first started this, and I think up another one, I'd be like, God, see, I still suck. Okay, I never realized it was actually, wow, I have more infrastructure, so now I can look at this blind spot that I didn't realize was there. So it's actually building that infrastructure. So with that said... A true identity wants to live from our ego. I don't see ego as a negative word. It's become a negative word and it can get a lot of people into treatment centers and make a lot of money. We all have an ego. We all have skin. We all put clothes on today and somehow we made it through this day and we want to learn. A balanced, healthy ego is what we're talking about here. So the ego gets out of balance and starts going, whoa, this isn't feeling right. I need to do something about it. So the true identity invents the scared child. And the scared child starts to learn ways to be taken care of. So it becomes the powder, the screamer, the crier, the seeker of approval, people pleaser, Chameleon, the victim, the martyr. Um, you guys could jump in and help me out here. The perfectionist. I guess I'm doing a good enough job. <laughs> the perfectionist. The, the runaway. What's that? The runaway. The runaway. I put the avoider. The runaway, the bolter. Um, the submissive one. The class clown. The clown. And the addict. Or pour me, pour me another drink. Wine, 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 give me some more wine. Okay? And so it comes up with these pieces. Now, Pia Melody realized, well, no, that's going to be mean. Um, Pia Melody did some great work, and the industry realized that we could turn codependency into a bad word. And in that bad word, then we buy a lot of books and we go to treatment centers and we do those things. These are codependent behaviors and all that that means 
is that I'm depending on someone else for my survival. So in our growth, we go from dependence to codependence, and some of us get lucky and go to interdependence. You notice I didn't say independence. That's not our species. Mm -hmm. And that's actually a contradependent, so it means they're a codependent. But that's a whole other talk, another day, so we won't go there. So the scared child is in a place that we learned from the beginning to have to live. So it says, if I hand my heart over to Nancy, you gotta take it, no choice. Okay. And I oh, I cry, I'm not gonna give you anything. I'm doing all these things, and Nancy's going, God, I hope Ted finishes pretty quick because this sucks. And I'm getting exhausted, and I'm getting tired, and uh, thank you, I'll take my heart back. You don't have to hold it. But I am working so hard because Nancy's holding my heart. And we all do it. And then, so, especially in emotional regression, which we talk about in the grief work, and we have loss, and we do emotional regression, as well as cognitive regression, we're going to move into these places. Because they are my survival skills. So if I have a loss, all of you are bigger than me, because I'm destroyed, so you must know a bit more than me, so you've all become my higher power. And please hold my heart. Hopefully we gain that back. So these are normal, and they're the skills we learn in order to live. Well, just like this, I got exhausted, and so my psyche goes, ah, I'll invent another thing. So it overpasses the true identity and invents the bully. So the bully is the judger, the aggressor, Perpetrator, the entitled and the elitist. And that can come in so many different ways. I'm smarter than you, I have more money than you, I'm a different, I'm a better color than you. Um, I paid you all this money, you better do this for me. I did all this work. So all the different ways that I can feel entitled or better than. <clears throat> Eric, I'm gonna come at you, okay? So please don't kick me. Unless you give me, don't give me permission. Okay, so really, the bully is that place where I'm being bigger than someone else or something else. While the scared child, or you're trying, is or I'm trying <laughs> in my brain, or the scared child, I am being smaller. So it's that hierarchical differential that I'm working on, all from being scared, all from some survival skill of fear from abandonment, which will lead to death. So these can be in many different ways, and this list can go on, of course. The addict, screw you, I'm gonna use anyway. Saboteur. Saboteur, and that can go on both sides, yeah. but most of these can. Okay, 